in the last few years, I think the the role and performance of the Kenya Revenue Authority has been um, a question that has been in the public. I think among the new taxes that government has generated was the digital services tax. Kenya is one economy in the continent, but also globally, in which uh, public affinity or public um, familiarity with uh, digital services and the consumption of digital services has grown, um, measured by the number of Kenyans uh, using uh, digital tools, but also measured by the forms of entertainment, but also digital services that Kenyans consume uh, in general. So over time, knowing that government is funded through um, revenues and taxation more principally, then obviously we'd expect that to be part of it. Um, so government has attempted uh, different forms of digital service revenue generation, and the KRA has been tasked, given that task. So we are coming here to discuss it both as citizens, but also to really just understand the design and the rationale for the digital services taxes that government has initiated. And obviously uh, that conversation will go on as a new finance bill will, will be coming in a while. So today we have with us a um, 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 our manager at the KRA, Nixon Omondi, to discuss and just create some education around what the digital services taxes are, uh, how it is managed, uh, the administrative part, and obviously which laws so far um, inform um, how digital services taxes are, uh, are levied. So without further ado, I'll invite Mr. Nixon Omondi, who is a manager at the Kenya Revenue Authority, to to make his presentation and thereafter we'll open up for a conversation for all of us. So Nixon, welcome and thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, as Nixon comes in, I'd just like to alert all of you that we record this just for the purposes of our archives and also to generate um, um, a record of this discussion. Um, so we ask you to keep your microphones and your cameras uh, switched off while he makes the presentation and then we'll open up for a Q&A session um, as soon as it's done. Thank you very much. So I'll, I'll do a quick presentation uh, just on the, the digital service tax. Uh, there's also a very closely related tax uh, referred to as uh, VAT on the same services. And then I'll also give a very brief, uh, you know, uh, presentation on what is happening in the international arena. So uh, with that, Bwanakwame, uh, uh, allow me to Put it up again. I hope now it won't misbehave. Okay, good. So we are all aware uh, that uh, data is 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 uh, driving the digital economy. And Kwame, just in case uh, I lose the uh, connection, you alert me uh, so that our participants can seamlessly listen to uh, this very good webinar. Uh, if you look at that that uh, pictorial, it just shows you what is happening in the digital space. This is data for 2022. How many people are streaming uh, viewer, uh, videos? How many people are spending on Amazon? How many people are using Tinder uh, at any given moment? I'm sure those who watch the Tinder Swindler um, uh, documentary are aware of that. How many people are using uh, Facebook what amount of content is being streamed every minute. Uh, so this data deals with per minute happenings in the digital space. We know that uh, Kenya has grown a lot, of course, with leaps and bounds uh, with respect to uh, digitalization and digitization. And we are also aware of the government's uh, effort uh, to ensure that all government services uh, are in the digital space so that we do away with a bit of these manual processes. And thanks to uh, our, the growth of internet penetration, actually uh, 2021 data by uh, the ICT ministry indicate that uh, the internet penetration in Kenya is uh, not less than 40% uh, by 2021. Uh, it also tells us of uh, Kenyans, about 21.75 million uh, Kenyans are internet users. Uh, that is serious penetration of the internet use uh, in, 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 in this space. Then uh, we, we also have uh, uh, 11 million Kenyans, more than 11 million Kenyans in the social media. So the digital economy and transformation is actually real. But part of it is because of uh, our good interconnectivity 
and also uh, the, the, the revolutionary uh, M-Pesa that uh, has enabled people, you know, you're able to buy your bundles and you're able to undertake all these other things in the digital space. So we're actually very well advanced in terms of uh, digitalization compared to uh, peer countries. And uh, also important to note, because many people have an issue with uh, why DST. Uh, many a time have come uh, to meetings, have attended meetings where uh, people are still stuck in why would we charge uh, income tax to a company uh, or an entity that is not resident in Kenya. This is because the laws are actually stuck in the 1927 uh, structure, you know, by the four economists that were uh, mandated by the OEEC, that was the OECD predecessor entity then, to come up with the ways of ensuring that people are not double taxed and people actually get to pay taxes where they enjoy government benefits, but in a, in a more significant manner. And, and so the economists came up with the, the residence uh, basis of taxation and the source basis of taxation under some, some theories that I'm sure Kwame will take us through one time. So if you look at the, the, those theories and the, and the, the basis of taxation, as had been for the last uh, uh, almost 100 years, it has been based on physical presence. So that if you are not physically present in a jurisdiction, then you don't pay taxes uh, in that jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, what happens is uh, digitalization has actually challenged uh, that kind of basis. Because people are able to interact with your economy big time without necessarily having to have a physical presence in your jurisdiction. And that kind of structure was also embodied in the various tax treaties. Because when we are negotiating a treaty, for example, Kenya and another country, we like to borrow a lot from the model tax conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, there are usually two that are mostly used. Of course, the others that are also used. Uh, we have the OECD and the UN. And Article 7 of that treaty, or the model tax convention, provides that business profit should only be taxed where somebody is having a permanent establishment or ha is a resident of that uh, jurisdiction. When you look at the issue of permanent establishment, it's about being physically present in a certain area for a period of time. If you look at the issue of residency, it's also about physical presence. But all this is being challenged by the digital economy because these entities come into Kenya, they use the Kenyan infrastructure that is provided by the government, of course, through the taxpayer's money, to make or do business, and they don't contribute to our jurisdiction. So that is why it was important to discuss how to tax the digital economy. Uh, of course, that is related to the restrictive nature of physical presence provision, very close to the tax structures we discussed in 1927. Then we also have issues around even for indirect tax like VAT. You know, for a long time before 2021, if a Kenyan was providing streaming services and, and, and you know, they, they, they meet the VAT threshold of 5 million, they are required to charge VAT uh, to the final consumers. Such a provision did not exist uh, for non-residents who are providing similar services. So then it means Kenyan services look more expensive compared to somebody who is streaming the services from outside the country. So it was also important to uh, introduce provisions that will ensure that both residents and non-residents with respect to indirect taxes are treated equally. And also uh, what we call the destination, under the destination principle for VAT or GST, or what we call indirect taxes, you know, VAT should only be charged and collected at the final place of consumption. That is the destination principle. But the digital economy is challenging some of those uh, principles. Uh, I've given an example where uh, I I am a software, you know, I'm able to code a software and, and my friend Kwame here uh, is, is, is willing to buy that software and, and assume Kwame is not in Kenya, he's in uh, Ghana. I'm sure he, he borrowed the great good name from Ghana. So assume he's in Accra, I do the coding, I send him the software in Accra. Instead of downloading the software, he decides to move with that software to Dubai and download it. And then he, he goes to the US, for example, to give a presentation using that software. Where has the consumption of that software 
you know, uh, done or made. You know, so the digital economy is challenging such principles because you cannot tell whether downloading the software is more important than receiving it or is more important than using the software. So it was. It is also important to discuss such in the digital economy, and of course, uh, those who have interacted with the what we call transfer pricing. When you look at transfer pricing and the issue around value creation, for a long time, the the the, the, the very good economists like Kaplan and Coopers and all those other you know very 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 good uh, uh, you know economists have told us that value is created by functions that you do. So if you look at the outbound functions, inbound and all that, it's like value is only created based on what you are doing as the provider of the service or the good. But in the digital economy, uh, uh, the demand side is also providing value. A lot of us joined uh, some social media platforms because everybody is there or because those people who are there invited us to join them. So they were actually creating value to those platforms. So this discussion is also very important. Of course, the issues around beceration and profit shifting, okay, the discussion can never end, but we'll have it in this presentation, though in a very short way. So when you look at the digital economy, it's sometimes difficult to identify the remote sellers and domestic consumers. Sometimes the digit, digital value chain is hard to map and track, and that is part of the challenges in implementing DST and VAT, because these are people who are not in your jurisdiction. What if they fail to comply with the various regulations and laws that you put in place? Where do you get them? They don't have bank accounts in Kenya. And there was a discussion that we should have rules just to deal with the digital economy alone. But the whole, the global community is also agreeing that you cannot ring fence because all the facets of the, of the, of the, of the economy, all the industries, be it medical, be it agricultural, be it transport, you know, education is all being digitalized. So there's need to be robust laws that are able to capture all the industries as one as they benefit from the effect of, of digitalization. So uh, the, the global community uh, under the tutelage of OECD uh, somewhere in 2013 and 2015 proposed a number of measures to ensure that those who are deriving income from jurisdictions in which they are uh, you know, doing business, not physically, but at least they have sales needed to get a, a slice of, 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 of the revenue. So one of the measures is what, uh, what they call unilateral tax measures. Unilateral meaning each jurisdiction sees what is best for them and implement those measures uh, in the digital space. So one of the recommendations under unilateral measures is DST. You'll see a map of several countries that have uh, come up with digital service tax, which is based on gross sales. Uh, of course, the practice varies per country. In some countries, it is net. In some countries, uh, the DST is limited to certain uh, digital services and all that. And then there's also equalization levy, uh, which is akin to DST implemented by India, 6% on online advertising. But of course, later in 2020 and 2021, uh, India expanded uh, the scope of this uh, levy to also introduce DST on on-demand uh, services, uh, the, the, what we call the OTTs, uh, over-the-top services and, and uh, those subscription-based services. There's also another variant of a unilateral measure done by Nigeria, where they call it significant digital presence. That is, if an entity that is not physically present and doing business in Nigeria provide the digital services uh, to the tune of at least $65,000, I don't know how much would that be in Naira, then they are deemed to be doing significant business in, in Nigeria. And therefore, they will be subject to tax based on the Nigerian corporate tax rate, which is 30%. But there's assumption that the, the profit out of such business will be uh, about 20%. So effectively, they are also charging 6% on, on, on those digital services, even though they have a threshold which, which is different from other countries like Kenya. And then other countries introduce diverted tax profits where they look at uh, how much profits do you live in their jurisdiction. And if they feel you are not living enough, then they up uh, whatever amount so that 
you know, you don't divert any profits you've made in their jurisdiction to other jurisdictions, which we call low tax jurisdiction. Other countries have also introduced withholding tax. I've seen that in Asia, uh, a bit of also in South America, but also in Kenya in 2020, there was introduction of withholding tax on advertising by non-residents. So those are referred to as unilateral tax measures. Uh, another important one that we'll also have just a quick review is the global approach. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the membership of, uh, you know, what we call inclusive framework, uh, where Kenya is a member, felt that if each country was to go alone in taxing the digital economy, it would give rise to issues around double taxation, double non-taxation, and maybe the companies that are operating in the digital space will be adversely affected. So they felt, why don't we have a global approach? Why don't we have a multilateral uh, manner of taxing not just the digital economy, because uh, the issue is you cannot ring fence and say this is digital and this is not digital. But all industries uh, basically have benefited from the effect of digitalization. Why don't we have a tax that will, uh, you know, have uh, effect to everyone based on certain metrics? Uh, the UN has also introduced uh, through their model tax convention, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, we borrow a lot from the UN Model Tax Convention and the OECD Model Tax Conventions. Wherever we are doing uh, or discussing or uh, ne negotiating a treaty with another country, so the OECD amended the, the UN sorry amended their Article 12. Article 12 deals with how to tax royalties. Article 12A deals with what we call technical services, and then Article 12B they are proposed to tax what we call automated digital services. So that if there are digital services that are provided to mass, uh, in, in some quarters we call them business to consumer services, then they should be taxed either based on gross or based on profits, uh, but the two countries need to agree on how the taxation of those automated digital services should then happen. Because they believe this is th this basis of taxation will not lead to double taxation because there'll be uh, credits or exemption, uh, you know, given to each, you know, based on how the countries will actually negotiate. Another matter which I think I explained is on the VAT on digital marketplace supplies. Of course, we've changed it uh, to be uh, VAT on electronic, uh, internet, or services provided through a digital marketplace, just to capture uh, the whole digital economy as we understand it. And then there are also collaborative compliance. The global community is working on a lot of initiatives so that countries can exchange information. Countries can assist one another to collect taxes. And, 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 and that is because of the challenges that digitalization has brought. And of course, anti-avoidance rules under the base erosion and profit shifting. DST is not unique in Kenya. We were not the first country to introduce DST in Africa. I think Tunisia was the first one. A host of countries are in the process of introducing DSTs. Europe has DSTs, South America, the Caribbean, a lot of countries have DSTs. And you're able to see in this uh, table, uh, DST provided by a lot of the countries are EU. You are able to see their rates ranging from 2 to 7.5%. Uh, some have two rates based on different services the scope and some countries have threshold as I also explained for uh, for Nigeria. A lot of countries in Africa are actually coming to Kenya to benchmark on how to best uh, implement DST. So we are not an island in doing DST. Many other countries have joined us. So DST specifically was introduced uh, to capture uh, digital services. Uh, that is to mean if you are offering uh, or selling goods through a digital platform, you are not subject to DST because you are selling physical goods. But whoever is providing digital services, maybe uh, facilitating such a sale uh, so that they earn a commission by helping you to either market, advertise, or get customers through an online means, they are the ones who will be subject to DST. So according to the structure of our DST, uh, when DST started, uh, it, it, it was applicable on both residents and non-residents. But uh, later, after about six months, it was felt that residents were already shouldering the COP tax and many other advanced taxes. And so it was limited to only uh, non-residents. So effective 1st of July, 2021, only non-resident entities, entities that do not have 
a physical presence in Kenya get to pay a digital service tax. Then there's also VAT, which I explained earlier, which was also effective in 2021, so that anyone who is providing uh, services uh, to Kenyans, uh, digital services, also get to charge VAT, just like our Kenyan entities will also be uh, charging VAT. But we've also gotten into a lot of collaboration with the marketplaces. We know some of them, uh, just to ensure that we can get information uh, on the digital space. We have also done capacity building in our area. We've benchmarked with a lot of countries just to ensure that this DST is, can operate in an optimal manner. But we are also involved in the global discussion on, 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 on the two pillar solution, which I will explain uh, just shortly. So just uh, a bit deeper into DST, uh, the Kenyan DST is chargeable on 1.5% of the gross transaction value that is provided to the Kenyan consumer or the Kenyan user. It is done by non-residents and what we've done is to avail a platform where non-residents are able to get a PIN, they're able to register for the DST, they're able to file DST returns and they're also able to pay the DST tax, of course through the international payment system because you can you know, you can, you can actually pay wherever, from wherever location you are. It's a final tax on the non-residents, meaning once they've paid 1.5% of what they have obtained from Kenya, they are not subject to any other uh, further taxation. This tax is applicable on uh, services, subscription-based services, uh, gig economy. Uh, for example, you are subscribing uh, for a software, you are subscribing for a research uh, uh, database, uh, you, are, you are in the sharing economy, somebody is connecting buyers and sellers, riders and those who give rides, you know, uh, digital marketplaces connecting buyers of uh, physical products and sellers of those products. We are looking at that platform. Uh, software sales have mentioned online media because people subscribe to international TV stations. They subscribe to online, uh, even social media and they pay. And, and I'm sure of, of the last one or two weeks, there's been a lot of issues around people who are paying uh, to be verified by Twitter. Then if Twitter is earning any income from Kenya by charging users uh, to be verified, that would form part of subscription-based media, and therefore the Twitter will be required to pay uh, this DST. There are also people who are doing uh, uh, inter uh, internet protocol TV, online TV stations and they do subscription, sale of data and even booking platforms. You want to visit an hotel in Mombasa, you go to an international platform, you get your hotel, make your reservation, the, the, the platform gets to get commission, that is also deemed to be a digital service uh, subject to DST. Of course, I've already mentioned the issue of registration, filing and assessment. We've delivered the ITAC system that can enable the non-residents to uh, comply with it, this tax, but they are also allowed to appoint a resident, uh, what we call a tax representative, somebody who is locally based in Kenya, to assist them in registration, in filing and also payment of the tax. So the, the, the tax representative acts on behalf of the taxpayer who is non-resident. Payment is just like many of our other taxes, VAT, PAE, uh, PAE is by 9th. Uh, the, 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 we have 20th uh, for this tax, and then compliance is done on ITAX. Penalties and interests are applicable. Uh, so if they fail to pay on time, they are penalized just as all our, non -re our resident taxpayers. And of course, there's a very close link between this tax and uh, tax paid by non-residents under Section 9.2. Section 9.2 of the Income Tax Act is about telecommunication services that is provided by non-residents. And they are all listed there, the VSAT, cable services, okay? So when those services are provided, they are supposed to be captured under that section and not digital service tax, which is uh, contained in Section 12E of the Income Tax Act, uh, together with the attendant regulation 207 of 2020. And then there is also income which is subject to withholding tax under Section 1035 and the third schedule. Withholding tax touches on a number of services, uh, software, uh, you know, uh, training. Uh, so there's a very thin line between these digital services and maybe an e-training 
where you've subscribed for training. So where withholding tax is applicable, uh, the section 12E3 provides that DST will not be applicable. So the uh, withholding tax and uh, tax on telecommunication services, which usually charge about 5%, take precedence over digital service tax. Then we also have this VAT, uh, which initially was to be based on business to consumer services, but effective uh, July after the Finance Act of 2022, all digital services uh, are required to be subject to VAT, and that VAT should be accounted for by the non-resident provider. So an example would be, if I'm acquiring a, a Microsoft Office, Office suite for my use, for example, in this laptop that I'm using, Microsoft is required to register and charge VAT at 16% and remit that VAT uh, to the commissioner. Again, if KRA, for example, was to procure such a software, they will also be required, to, the, the Microsoft will be required to charge 16% and remit. If an entity that is trading, ABC Limited, which is registered for VAT, is also charged by Microsoft, they will then be allowed to claim any input tax they have incurred by being charged by the non-resident. The scope of services are similar to what I illustrated for DST, subscription-based, online intermediation, online trend, trading, and even when you look at uh, Regulation 29 that became effective from 21st of March uh, 2023, there are also services that enable payments. So there are those online platforms that facilitate payments. They are owned by non-residents. There are also platforms that enable exchange of digital currency, uh, what we call digital assets, whether they are NFTs, non-fungible tokens, or they are cryptocurrencies, those platforms are required to account for uh, uh, this VAT. So they will charge 16% as they charge their commission on facilitating those exchanges, they are required to levy an additional 16% as VAT and remit it to the commissioner. They are also allowed to appoint tax rep to account for the VAT. But one important thing to note, this tax category of taxpayers under this regime are not allowed to claim any input tax on the supplies they are made to Kenya. So if, for example, it's Microsoft that is charging VAT, we require them to pay 16% of the total amount they have supplied to Kenya without claiming any input tax incurred in Kenya. Of course, we'll also be checking on what input tax would they be incurring in Kenya. Another important aspect is, even as we are looking into implementing the teams and the e-teams, this category of taxpayers are exempt. Uh, from the teams and the e-teams provisions, what we usually call the ETR, electronic tax registers or electronic invoicing. It's because of the challenges that uh, they would meet if they were required to uh, implement uh, the, the, the e-teams or the teams uh, provisions that we have in Kenya. Tax rate is same 16%. So just as a summary of the two taxes, uh, they are given PINs through a simplified registration. They file returns which are simplified. Remember, for DST, they just quote the total amount that they have provided to Kenyans, and then the tax will be applicable. For VAT, they don't claim any input tax uh, in, in card in Kenya, so their returns are simplified. Of course, they provide the returns monthly. Due date for the two taxes is also 20th. And uh, the good thing with the DST is that it doesn't create obligation of doing a nil return. So for DST, all they need to do for the non-residents for purposes of simplification is that it's only a payment return. So if they have nothing to pay in that month, they don't do anything, they don't file any return, they don't pay zero uh, in, in short. But uh, they are required to file and pay in a month in which they have provided services to Kenyans. Electronic payment through ITAX, just like our residents, and I also mentioned the issue of they can appoint a, a tax resident in Kenya to act as a, as a tax representative for purposes of these two taxes that I have mentioned. So that is a, a brief of what we have as DST in Kenya and also uh, VAT, uh, but much more is uh, the international uh, discussion. So in 20, between 2012 and 2015, the OECD uh, started an initiative after a lot of cases in the EU and also in the US uh, on tax avoidance. And uh, that tax initiative was referred to as base erosion and profit shifting. It was recognized that multinationals who are using the loopholes that were available in law 
uh, both fraudulently or both under tax avoidance to ensure that they pay as little tax as possible. So the OECD together with the inclusive framework where Kenya became a member, there are currently about 134 members. Uh, Kenya became a member from January 2017. They, they came up with 15 initiatives on how to tackle international tax avoidance. So one of the initiatives is under initiative one. We call it BEPS Action One, the digital economy. So that is where the, the options of having unilateral measures emanated from and Kenya picked DST as, as a way of uh, tackling the issue of digital economy and collecting some tax from the non-residents who are benefiting. Uh, from you know the services provided by the government through the public funds of course that uh, Kenyans pay as tax uh, so that they also support uh, the development of our country. So uh, in 2015 uh, there was a bit of discussion on how to implement that uh, BEPS Action 1, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Action 1, but uh, it, it peaked speed in 2016-17 and in 2021 uh, the global community under the inclusive framework came up with what we call a two-pillar approach uh, so that not every country introduced their own way of taxing the digital economy, but having a unified way of looking at this, uh, this digital economy. So there are two pillars. Uh, the first pillar is what we call pillar one. And pillar one uh, has two facets, amount A and amount B. Quite complex, but I think I'll just give a highlight so that we are aware. Amount A is supposed to support or replace the unilateral measures, the DSTs, the equalization levies, you know, that have been introduced by different countries. So that is the first role of Amount A. In fact, uh, it is being implemented through a, mount, a multilateral convention. And for you to be a signatory of that convention, and to effect that multilateral convention in your country, you are required to suspend uh, any unilateral measure as defined by Article 38 of that multilateral convention. So there are many articles, uh, quite a number, but the, 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 the structure of Amount A can be divided into building blocks. So the key building blocks is about scope. What does Amount A or whom does Amount A applies to? Then they have what we call the nexus. How do you, uh, how does a country get to a share of amount A under the nexus rules? And quickly, just for this audience to remember, amount A will be applicable on the most profitable and the largest companies of the world. And, and currently they are slightly, maybe less than 150. The scope is to apply on uh, companies that have 20 billion euro turnover in any given year. I think that is very close to what Kenya Revenue Authority collects per year. Uh, then most profitable implies uh, entities that earn on a global basis, not less than 10% uh, uh, you know, uh, profit on revenue. So you look at your profit level divided by the total revenue globally. If you meet 10%, then you are within scope. So two important scope rules, uh, the, the, the the profitability, the global profitability, and the global turnover. Of course, there's a whole uh, document on how do we define that turnover? How do we define that profitability? But we can leave that for now. So this amount A is what's supposed to replace the unilateral measures, including DST. And then there's a portion of amount A, which is to simplify transfer pricing rules. Allow me not to get into that. But key in amount A, is administration of that tax on a global basis and also ensuring that there is no uh, uh, double taxation and ensuring that any dispute is resolved in a multilateral ma manner. So it's a whole new realm of taxation that has never been. And that's why uh, the inclusive framework felt we should only apply it to very large companies that have the capacity uh, to, add, to, 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 you know, to maybe have employees or to ensure they are able to comply with this new uh, taxation rule. So Kenya has been on the table uh, discussing this amount A, and I'm, I'm sure of, of late you've had a lot of hulabaloo about, oh, Kenya has this uh, suspended DST, they are joining the OECD. The discussions on amount A are still far from over. We are part, uh, participating in the discussions. 
Uh, hopefully they might uh, be concluded by July or August, but that is still too ambitious. Then the multilateral convention needs to be signed by all the countries and then be ratified and implemented in the various jurisdictions. So until then, it's difficult to say whether when Kenya will actually adopt the amount A, because the text is not complete and the process of ratification is also has to be done in accordance with the Article 26 of the Constitution on, on treaty making and ratification, and of course with that, the Attendant Act. Then there's also a very important uh, Pillar 2 issue, because I've adapted this from the University of Wien, uh, on the global rules. Uh, what what the, uh, the, the international community is discussing is how to ensure that every multinational pays at least some tax in jurisdiction where they're operating. Uh, some people have likened this to our own minimum tax that was introduced under Section 12D, but they are not the same. So what the global community has agreed is that these GLOBE rules will be implemented based on what the country requires. This is not a multilateral convention basis like Amount A, but Kenya can decide to implement the GLOBE rules to ensure that every entity that is operating in Kenya at least leaves a 15% uh, uh, minimum tax, which is based on the effective tax rate. If UK implements these rules, for example, then wherever a UK headquartered entity is operating, they need to pay at least 15% tax. Unfortunately, according to the rules, the tax of a UK entity operating in Kenya is supposed to be collected by the UK, Her Majesty Revenue and Customs. However, there, are also, there have also been flexibility in the rules to introduce sub-rules to ensure that Kenya can also collect uh, that uh, the, 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 the top up if the company is not taxed to the level of 15%. So these are different discussion years, but still under the same uh, 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 digital economy. But you can see it is very different from the digital uh, economy that is being discussed. We actually say it's, it looks a bit misplaced, but it's to ensure that uh, tax low tax jurisdictions are not used uh, to, 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 to do tax avoidance. Actually, that is the whole essence of the Pillar 2 uh, GLOBE rules. Of course, there are many rules, sub-rules within uh, these GLOBE rules and the subject to tax rules, but uh, allow me today not to get into the technicalities. Maybe one time we'll just have a session to discuss the effect of the GLOBE rules, maybe in Kenya and Africa, and that will give us a better, a better view. So, uh, 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 senior Kwame, with that, allow me to end the presentation and then we can pick uh, questions, discussions, comments as you will guide. Asante. Uh, thank you very much, Nixon. Uh, so let me just try and summarize in two minutes and then I'll allow my, my colleague uh, Fiona to manage the question and answer session. So I'm very thankful. So I think we started by basically giving us a grounding about the fact that, yes, um, digital services are ubiquitous. I think they are, they are a function of every economy now. We also have the problem about uh, the consumption of services is happening and digital services challenge the idea of collecting taxes only within the geographical jurisdictions that we are aware, we, we are aware of and for which, of course, national tax authorities have res primary responsibility. Um, and then you talked about the global approach, which then provides two pillars. There's the unilateral measures and the global approach. Um, Kenya has taken part of the unilateral measures, which is basically taxing the service. And out of that, obviously, is where the digital services tax uh, uh, design comes from, which is in Kenya's case. Um, so basically, it was intended to capture digital services. Of course, it was initially applicable to residents and non-residents, but then it was changed because residents already have um, a taxation um, um, obligation, and it was only to include non-resident ent entities. In addition to the digital services tax, then there is a VAT. So over, over under Kenya's digital services taxes, obviously there's a one and a half percent of turnover, and then of course a VAT component for the amount that that takes place. So I think that's clear. Then you talked us back, you took us back to the OECD, which you said has 15 initiatives on how to, inter to govern international tax avoidance, um, and of course that's one of the those that Kenya. Then I mean, took a, took um, the initiative to establish the digital services tax. 
uh, and there are two pillars. So the first pillar, which is also, in my view, still very complicated, but basically there's an amount A plus amount B. The intention is to ensure tax certainty, and it's mostly applicable only to large corporations which have uh, transnational presence, um, but a, a multilateral convention is yet to be concluded, meaning that obviously there's still some time to go, Me, uh, and therefore the digital services tax as envisaged in Kenya, I think it still has some time, and there's no um, reason to think that it's either been repealed or that, that it has been changed. And then the pillar two, which is basically um, GLOBE rules, um, and here it says something that is very interesting, and I think something that every Kenyan would agree with, that every transnational corporation should pay or must pay some tax in every jurisdiction in which they operate. And the intention is to have a minimum rate of 15% effective tax rate. So the difference uh, is what a national jurisdiction would have the possibility of, 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 of covering. And the intention of the GLOBE rules, as you emphasized, is to ensure that uh, that transnational corporations don't take advantage of low tax jurisdictions. Um, and we know some countries have very low tax jurisdictions, close to <laughs> close to zero. Uh, and that those ta low tax jurisdictions are then not used for tax avoidance globally, because that has uh, um, um, an externality for other countries. So with that, I think you brought us back uh, generally. And obviously, I think this is very highly simplified. You're right as well that we need to actually take each of those pillars in turn and discuss them at a future date. So thank you very much. And I'd like to hand over our conversation now to Fiona Kalia, who's an assistant program officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs in the Economic Regulation Program. And she'll take us through the um, through the plenary session. Fiona, welcome. Thanks, Kwame. Um, thank you as well, Nixon, for that um, presentation. So during this session, uh, there are two ways that you can ask your question. One, you could either raise your hand and then I will see you and uh, and pick you and then you can ask your question directly to Nixon. The second is this, we have a chat box so you can type your question and then I will read it out to him. Um, so as we wait, Nixon, I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, um, because this digital service tax is only limited to the residents, yet we have quite a number of businesses in the digital space that are not being taxed. So how how does, um, I don't know, can I say carry or the government go, how do, how do they deal with this? Because are there other parallel taxes that they will introduce to, to this particular category because you know for example i could give an example of you have maybe guys who are selling shoes online but they don't really have a physical presence per se because maybe i'm just selling from um, my house and then i can i do online deliveries so how do we how does government capture and tap into that in order to say increase the revenues from that particular um uh, segment of of uh, businesses. Thank you, Fiona. You want you want me to take that? I thought you maybe there are others, <laughs> but I can, uh, can I can pick questions. it up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's it's I, and uh, allow me to thank uh, Kwame for the very good summary. You know that's the beauty of having economists in the house. Now, uh, for for people who are selling wares or products online, and they are Kenyans, the current framework of law is sufficient to ensure that each one of us pay our fair share of tax. Of course, if you don't, then now there are those uh, enforcement mechanisms that carry then has to take uh, to ensure that you also comply. But I also mentioned in my presentation that we're also getting into collaborative uh, agenda with most of these marketplaces, including uh, Facebook, where you can use to market and meet your clients so that they can give us data about uh, these people who are selling items online. Where are they? How much did they make? And then we can follow up and check whether you, you, you actually paid your fair share. Uh, introducing a different tax for them, yes, it's a discussion that uh, I've had internally uh, on whether there's need to introduce a separate tax. 
Uh, but again, you, you, you don't want to introduce a tax that its implementation will also be jeopardized by the way the digital economy operates. So it's a bit intricate, but it's a discussion that we are having. But currently, uh, maybe in summary, Fiona, is that if you're selling items online, if you're doing more than 5 million, please make sure you are registered for VAT, charge VAT, and remit that VAT to, uh, to KRA. If you're also selling online, whether you meet the threshold or not, uh, you need to account for your either turnover tax, where your turnover is less than 50 million, or account for business profits at, at, at if you are an individual at the graduated rate, uh, 10, 25, and 30 percent. If you are a corporate or you are operating under a company uh, which is uh, incorporated, then you do 30 percent of the profits that you have made. So I think it's more of uh, our own national duty as Kenyans uh, to take up, uh, you know, our tax obligations and pay because that's the only way that the government is able to provide uh, the, the public goods and, of course, uh, public services. But that said, uh, don't wait until KRA, you know, gives you a notice that we've noted that through platform XYZ, you have sold 30 million over the last five years and you've never accounted for any tax. It will be quite uh, punitive and, and a bit disruptive uh, to just not your life alone, but also to the business. But remember, DST is not chargeable on, on the goods. It's on the platform owner who is providing digital services. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I can see there's a question from Maureen Mwendwa. She's asking, what is the impact of the DST on the overall tax revenue collection mm -hmm. in Kenya, since its implementation is the revenue generated in line with your initial projections? Thank you. Uh, a very good question because, of course, Kenyans need to be interested in knowing what's the impact of uh, revenue initiatives that we have. Given that DST is a very modest tax, 1.5%, that's very modest based on uh, the scope of services that uh, DST covers. So, of course, based on projections, year on year, uh, KRA has been meeting the DST target, uh, and, and uh, we've actually surpassed uh, what we are supposed to collect on a yearly basis. On whether uh, it is significant compared to either the GDP or compared to the overall tax collection, it is not very significant based on the 1.5%. But I think since it started, we are we are just uh, hitting about 1 billion since, not very significant. And that's why you've heard of talks on, can we increase it to other countries' rates? 3%, 4%, 6%, you know, just to be at par with other, other, other countries, but also uh, to be at par with other services which are equivalent. For example, somebody is providing telecommunication services who is charged at 5% under Section 92. Why don't we have DST also at that level to ensure that the principle of neutrality is also maintained? But those are discussions, I think, that are still in the public domain. Uh, thank you, Maureen, for that question. Um, anyone else with a question? Okay, next one. I I guess there are no more questions. Um, so maybe I can just pass it back to Kwame for closing remarks. Kwame? All right. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks a lot. Um, Nixon, I was going to ask a question before you close. And the question I have is, uh, what do you think is the compliance rate with the with the DST? Um, uh, I mean, that, that would be very interesting. And, and after that, then you can give us your final remarks and then I'll close. Thanks. Thank you, Kwame, for that. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to have the compliance rate for these taxpayers, and partly because of the challenge of lack of public data. I think as economists, maybe you can assist us to know what is the size of the digital economy, first of all. Who are the players? Because, of course, the main players are known, and, and, and maybe the top 20, 30 are generally known, and they are already in the fold. And, and, and if we are able to get a database of these are the players in this economy, 
they are 2,000, they are 10,000, then it would be easy to know who is in the fold, who is not in the fold. But as currently constituted, we use more public knowledge and, and, and our interaction and, 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 and experience uh, in knowing who is supposed to be in the fold and who is not to be in the fold. And then uh, on the general compliance rate, I think I can say it is over 90%, because rarely do we have taxpayers who file and fail to pay within the same month. They are all uh, compliant, maybe basically because of reputational risks, because most of these multinationals guard their risk with all that they, they, they have. So the general compliance rate is super. Uh, what we don't know is whether we have the correct population uh, so that we are able to bring everybody who is required to be on board. If it's about uh, crypto exchanges, are they all on board? If it's the online on-demand uh, videos, are they all in, 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 in the fold? If it's about software providers, have they all come in? But I think that is now what we are discussing with the other government agencies and the financial institutions so that we are able to know who is who and who is uh, uh, complying and who is not complying. But it's a discussion I think that uh, has to continue, Kwame. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you very much. Oh, let me see if there's one more question on the on the chat. Um, oh, that, that's been asked. So thank you very much, Nixon. We knew that you had um, an appointment in Parliament uh, close to now. So we let we let we let Nixon leave. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are thankful for you all being here. I think we have some um, uh, understanding of what uh, digital services tax, what the background is, what the global environment is, and what kind of changes we might we might anticipate. Uh, so contrary to what some of us have been, dis some what has been discussed, it's clear that the digital services tax is here. Uh, I think government is continue to going to continue to implement it. And uh, the only way we can talk about other conversations we can have is how to make it efficient and less disruptive to businesses and obviously uh, affecting business performance in general. It's administration, uh, as di as Nixon has actually told us, uh, government is conscious of that and tries as much as possible, at least the care to make it not just easy to collect, but as uh, to reduce the disruption and obviously any frictions to businesses in general. So we are encouraged to all be part of this conversation because at the global level, of course, the global approach is still open or the inclusive framework and the, that global approach is still open. It has pros and cons on all those proposals and it's essential for us to be not only appraised of what those discussions are on the progress, but also what the implications may be for Kenyan businesses. Finally, the Institute of Economic Affairs is a professional organization. We have members and we encourage any Kenyan professional who's interested in being a member to get in touch with us um, so that you can become a member, participate in conversations like this. And obviously we can also tap into your experience and uh, professional capability. Um, and I'd like to thank Nixon for being here. Nixon, thank you very much. And uh, we hope you all have a good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleague Fiona will prepare a short brief about today's conversation and we'll send it out to everybody who's been there. So thank you very much everyone and have a good morning. Bye. Bye and thank you. Bye, thank you.